Hello, folks. This is a story of great events that prior to every 16 in the heavens, the 4th of July, Independence Day. And they bring a warm, proud feeling to our hearts, a feeling of thanksgiving that we are Americans. Today, I'm speaking from Philadelphia, where the Declaration of Independence was pretty bell, rang out the glad news where the first United States flag, Philadelphia, where American liberty and freedom were born. I'm getting ahead of my story. How about taking a little trip with me down the broad Benjamin Franklin Parkway to Old Philadelphia, a Philadelphia hidden away beneath the towering skyline of recent years. Let's go back to the Philadelphia of William Penn, of Robert Morris, of Benjamin Franklin, of the Continental Congress, of the days before and after the American Revolution, many other things we read about in our history book. The first thing we see is the statue of William Penn atop City Hall Tower, looking over the millions of acres granted him by the crown and named Pennsylvania. Lands which through wise and honest dealings with the Indians actually became Penn's Woods and laid the foundation for the greatest industrial state in the Union. And here near 6th and Chester's Pendence Hall, the greatest national shrine of our country. While we look at the old Suppose we let our imaginations carry us back to those days, more than a century and a half ago, when such men as Benjamin Franklin, John Hancock, Robert Morris, John Adams, and many other famous patriots of the time met to sign the Declaration of Independence to proclaim our nation a free country. There they are, those wise, brave, and determined men from the 13 original American colonies who thought so little of the fact that to place their signature to such a declaration made them marked men subject to execution if caught by the Redcoats. Men who thought so much of the principles set down in this historic document that they read and read again, discussed and debated before signing for the particular colony they represented. Thomas Jefferson, fiery advocate of freedom's cause, wrote the Declaration of Independence at 7th and Market Street, two blocks away from Independence Square. John Hancock, first signer, inscribed his name with a great flourish in letters so large he said, the king will be able to read that even without his spectacles. Benjamin Franklin, after signing, said to John Hancock, we must indeed hang together, or most assuredly, we shall all hang separately. The Liberty Bell, most beloved of all national emblems next to the flag, rang out the news of independence July 4th, 1776. Now hanging in the foyer of Independence Hall, it is visited by millions who stand and look in reverence. The great crack which occurred during the tolling of the bell in honor of Supreme Court Chief Justice Marshall at the time of his death stands as a venerable service stripe in an ageless and everlasting symbol of American independence. In June of the next year, after the signing of the Declaration, the Congress of the United States assembled in Independence Hall and adopted the resolution which established the Stars and Stripes. Tradition likes to say that General Washington came to Betsy Ross House at number 239 Art Street and arranged with her the design of the first American flag with its alternate 13 red and white stripes and its 13 stars in a circle on a blue field. The stripes standing for the original 13 colonies and the stars denoting the states, which now have grown to 48 in all. Yes, gallant ladies played a very important part in the early history of our country, as they have ever since. For instance, believe it or not, Philadelphia and modern Betsy Ross still make old glory for the United States Army at the Philadelphia Quartermaster's Depot. Thirteen operations are now necessary in the manufacture of the once handmade stars and stripes. One hundred stripes are cut in a single operation, as are the blue fields for the stars. The stars themselves are stamped out with a steel cutting die and are stitched on a special electric machine so fast your eyes can hardly follow. Why the haste? Well, now, it takes a lot of flags to fly over the land of the free and the home of the brave, today with 135 million Americans. But getting back to old Philadelphia, religion played a big part in our early history. For in those days, coming to Pennsylvania meant to escape from religious persecution in Europe, where the state dictated the church of the people. It meant worshiping as you wished in a new free commonwealth. The oldest church building in Philadelphia is Old Swede where we see this annual pageant being reenacted. This church, built in 1700, was erected on the site of a previous blockhouse church and marks continuous service since Trinity Sunday, 1677. 
Christ Church, built in 1727, is distinguished both as the original Protestant Episcopal Church in America and as first President George Washington's church during his stay with his family in Philadelphia when it was our nation's capital. Many times during the trying years of the new republic, Washington could have been seen entering his pew and praying for guidance to steer the ship state on a true and wise course, just as he prayed in the snows of Valley Forge when he and his men met the darkest days of their campaign. Gethsemane of the Continental Army, where strong and courageous souls almost gave up the fight under the terrific punishment of starvation, privation, cold, and despair. Valley Forge, where only the indomitable spirit of General Washington and news of Benjamin Franklin's success in securing an alliance with France encouraged men to carry on in spite of impossible conditions. Today, over the rolling hills then commanded by redoubts mounting primitive cannon, down snowy paths then flecked with the red of bare and bleeding feet, across valleys where tents and log cabins housed patriots too determined to die. Today, over this hallowed ground, the dogwood blooms. Dogwood that seems to grow everywhere in this beautiful National Memorial Park just outside Philadelphia. Dogwood whose petal pink and white seems to commemorate the Patriots' blood spilled on driven snow. Dogwood that is a natural living monument to those who fought and died that a new nation might be born. He walked into Philadelphia at 16 with two loaves of bread and little else than the clothes he wore. And he lived to become known as a philosopher, diplomat, financier, inventor, scientist, and businessman. One of the great men of his time. That was Benjamin Franklin. In 10 years, Franklin was the best and biggest printer in America, producing textbooks, religious books, and the famous Poor Richard Almanac. While at the same time, he was doing all the government printing for Pennsylvania and adjacent colonies. Still, he found time with all of this to edit the magazine that later became the Saturday Evening Post. This is a printing press of Franklin's time, preserved in the institute that bears his name on the parkway in old Philadelphia. But Franklin's versatile talents did not be confined to printing. In 20 years, he became Philadelphia's most prominent citizen. He became clerk of the Colonial Assembly, organizer of the First Fire Brigade, founder of the Philadelphia Academy, Pennsylvania's first college, the colony's first postmaster, and its most potent politician behind the scenes. He formed the American Philosophical Society, invented a stove that gave twice as much heat for a quarter of the fuel, and originated bifocal spectacles. With all of this, Franklin's greatest service to his country was as a diplomat. When the newborn nation needed the recognition and help of foreign powers, to Franklin fell the task of wheedling vast sums of money from the treasury of France without credit or security. This Franklin accomplished even when Washington was defeated on Long Island and when the British took Philadelphia, Franklin still could get fresh loans. For this reason, it is often said that in some respects, greater than the services of General Washington was Franklin's contribution to the victory of the American Revolution. Yes, the history of old Philadelphia is a history of great men and women. And many self-built monuments remain a testimony to their greatness. Gerard College, for instance, example of the philanthropy and humanity of one of the richest men of his times, Stephen Gerard. This college, endowed for the education of poor orphan boys, has turned out many leading citizens of our nation. The main building has been called the most perfect Greek temple in existence today. William Penn's house, the first brick house erected in Philadelphia, built in 1682, regarded as the first state house of the province and was used as the proprietary governor's residence. It remains as a national monument to a great and wise man. Another famous landmark in Fairmount Park is the house of William Rittenhouse, first papermaker in America. It stands on the spot where his first mill was erected in 1690. In this house, David Rittenhouse was born, later to be known as the first practical scientist in America. A man of great mathematical genius and an astronomer of such ability that he gave the world the first approximately accurate measurements of the stars and planets. Also in Fairmont Park, largest city-owned park in the world, stands a remembrance of an infamous traitor to the young nation, General Benedict Arnold. It is Mount Pleasant Mansion, which Arnold bought as a wedding gift for his young bride, Peggy Shippen. Arnold had lived there but a short time 
when his treason was discovered and the property confiscated. The mansion later passed into the hands of General Jonathan Williams, who became the first superintendent of West Point Academy. Here is a sight that a fellow of any age can appreciate who has ever reached up his nickel for a delicious ice cream cone at the corner store. For it was from here that those happy jingling coins first came. The Philadelphia Mint, established by act of Congress 16 years after the birth of our nation. This was the first United States Mint and is now the largest in the world. Its output includes not only United States coinage, but that of many other nations as well. Now, doesn't speaking of nickels and ice cream cones just seem to lead our thoughts to the zoo? And here we are at the oldest city zoo in America, where almost every bird, beast, and reptile from the far corners of the world can be found. I hadn't seen such a brilliantly plumed macaw since my last trip through the South American jungles. And old Jimmy the hippo, with his two-ton appetite, just makes me realize I haven't eaten since breakfast. Yes, from the smallest to the largest, they are all here. Not to forget the most mischievous of all animals, old Mr. Monkey Shines himself. Well, now, help yourself to a nice, cool drink. My, my, you do have the kind of lips just made for that drinking fountain, don't you? What's this? Friar's Ice Cream Dixie. Oh, boy, you fellows know what's good. Get that last drop. And while we leave Kippy and Percy, the famous trained chimpanzees, to reminisce over their taste-tempting treat, there's another famous first in Philadelphia that I know will be interesting to you. 